This is off planet radio. Welcome everybody to a new year, a new season of Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins, and uh, <laughs> the things that go on before we even get to the camera and the microphone are amazing. Technical things that just shouldn't fail, but always do. And so welcome to 2019. Welcome to the decade of Off Planet Radio. Yeah, we started this in 2009. 10 years, and I feel every second of it right now. So, <laughs> here we go. We're going to launch into the decade. We've got um, amazing subject matter, an amazing guest, and I think we're going to start off this year by hitting the high end of the woo. Here we go. Emily Moyer, welcome. Hi, everybody. It's good to be back. Happy New Year. And um, we have some fresh energy, and we're ready to get going here. And um, we're going to start this year with. Uh, Unicorns and rainbows. <laughs> and, of course we are. <laughs> and, 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 and a returning guest who has, it, it's long overdue for her return and there have been many requests for her. And uh, we're always happy to have her with us. She's the author of Our Lives Beyond MKUltra 1 and 2. Elisa E., welcome back to Off Planet Radio. Thank you. Hi, Emily. Hi, Randy. Happy New Year. Hey, welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You're looking very well, Elisa. And, and you're looking you. just much more joyful than, than, than you have at other times. And it makes me very happy. Yeah. yeah, well, I've been, um, I've had access, been gifted access to some new healing modalities, too, that I'm using very consistently. So we'll see. Time awesome. will tell, right? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So as, as is usually the case with most of the topics for the show, it grows out of some private conversation that either Randy and I have had or that I've had with a guest or a listener or something. And um, this is no different. Uh, a few months ago, Lisa and I um, you know, she asked me if I had seen um, Melissa Melton and Aaron Dyke's excellent video about unicorn symbolism uh, there on Truth Stream Media. And I hadn't seen it. It had shown up in my feed and I had saved it and I hadn't seen it. But I, you know, I, I, I could have guessed because I'd been noticing it obviously uh, everywhere. It's we're, we're being inundated with, I mean, it, ha it started happening a long time ago, but it's just ramped up to fever pitch in the last year. So she asked if I'd watched it, and I said no, but we ended up getting into a conversation about how uh, unicorns had been you know, used basically on a certain level in both programming for her and for myself, and as part of a community that I had been involved in. And so um, you know, we got, had a long private discussion about it, and then... Um, when I decided to ask her back, I guess I was like, let's talk about this. And so you will hear us probably throughout this episode refer to both um, uh, Melissa Melton's video on True Stream Media and to a, a video called Charlie the Unicorn. And both of those videos will be linked in the description box and below. And um, so with no further, further ado, Elisa, tell me what happened when you saw this video and where this started your, what kind of trail this started your mind down. And then we can kind of pick up with some of the things we spoke about. Well, um, first of all, I do appreciate a lot of the, as you guys do, a lot of the work that um, Aaron and Melissa do mm -hmm. um, on, online. And um, basically the video was uh, Melissa and Aaron in their travels and going, just going to the grocery store and going to, you know, whatever stores to get what they needed. They started noticing that it was just this inundation over the top of unicorns over the top uh, around the side under the bottom through the middle oh <laughs> not just for kids that was the really bizarre part not just and not for just kids, for women but, yeah. and not yeah. just for women but for men as well so mm -hmm. um it, it it really was after watching their video and all the photos and, and videos and stuff they had taken that she compiled in there from all the different sources it really was creepy that that you know it's it's for me, as a program person, when I see anything that's brought into the public with such fervor and in such an overwhelming manner, you know that something's going on. And of course, I do have a, a very strange episode um, from years ago when I was up in Washington. Uh, 
regarding um, a, a, an odd interaction with people I was involved with, a boyfriend and a friend that had come up from Florida and a fight. And I wound up, long and short of it, I wound up in a, um, a little mom and pop motel in a motel room. And there was a huge print. <laughs> as soon as I closed the door in the room, there was a huge print um, of a unicorn in the room and it had a profound effect on me. So that was the history for me. And then seeing this video and this inundation of the unicorn. Um, and also after having talked to you and I tried to look this up before we went on air. Um, I don't, I no longer have it. I, I regret that I, I gave them to a friend. I no longer have Fritz Springmeier's, uh, those big, huge volumes of programming work. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm referring to that is because I know that unicorns were in there. Mm -hmm. And I cannot recall what he said about that being used in programming. So mm -hmm. um, I did try to find it. But yeah, so that's kind of what happened for me. It brought up the old stuff and, you know, and then we talked about it. So I, what I thought about, like, you know, I mean, I've been noticing this I mean, some, so, okay, so it popped up fairly big, like, in the rave scene, like, in the mid-2000s, just people, like, dressing like them, maybe at parties, or talking about it, and I remember, like, there was a costume party, and a lot of people had these, you know, uniforms, you know, you know unicorn costumes on, but for me, the whole unicorn thing goes back to childhood, and the period of time that I associated, associate with, like, just by the texture and the tone with like the heaviest amount of like my hypnotic kind of programming, which would be like between sometime between probably 1979 or 80 and like maybe 1987 or 88, where there was just that weird, like sort of everything had this like eighties cocaine. I mean, I was eight years old, but everything had that weird eighties music, cocaine, disco kind of, you know, late seventies into the early eighties, this feel about it, this tone, these colors and whatever. And I had some of those, purses and folders that Melissa was talking about with the Lisa Frank thing. But I remember very clearly, like I went to the movies one time and it was actually to see the movie, The Never Ending Story, which had that flying horse. Remember? I went to the movies to see The Never Ending Story and I had this purse that I had that I loved that had a unicorn on it. Right. And there was candy in the purse. I had sweet tarts in the purse. Right. And somehow I went to the movies with the purse and the sweet tarts. And when I left, I didn't have them. I don't know if I lost them there, if lost it there, but I remember being really, really upset about the loss of this purse with the unicorn on it and this box of sweet tarts. And I remember this movie being really seared into my mind, right? So I don't know if I just got so carried with the movie that I left it there or if there was something further going on, because I do think that uh, for me, there was a lot of programming in my life around movies and around the narratives part of movies that was particularly something like Never Ending Story, Flashdance. I'll go in sometime to. Um, I'll go in, I've never told the complete story of the flash dance program and I'll go into that at some point. But I remembered this purse with this brown purse with this unicorn with the, you know, like, and the sweet tarts inside, right? So there you have like the symbol, the movie, the candy, there you go, everything you need to do to program a kid, right? So, but I just associate the unicorns with that time. And then I recalled as you and I were talking that there was this, uh, and this may have even come up possibly once before, but I don't think the exact example of this was when I was with, speaking with the stuff with Mark Devlin, right? And, and, and so there was this video that people were really looking at uh, in about 1999 or 2000 who were in the rave scene called Charlie the Unicorn. And this was something that people who were very into the use of ketamine were they like, passing this around. In fact, this was one of the first videos that I recall going viral on YouTube, right? Like back like in 1999 or 2000. And it's this very strange short video Then there's a series that have been made more. We'll link to them. But um, I recalled this as Elisa and I were talking. So I asked her to, to uh, take a look at the video. <laughs> and uh, you took a look at the video. What did you think? Creepy, creepy. It is just so, I mean, it's one of those typical things where you know people have to be in an altered state, have to be in an altered state to appreciate it. You'd have to be high to appreciate mm -hmm. it. It's just creepy and uh, I mean, it's this animated thing that is clearly not intended for kids, you know, it's, it's harsh, it's, um, it's idiotic is what it is, but mm -hmm. there's all this other symbolism mixed into it. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I'm not recalling right now, I, I didn't watch it again before, I, as I told Emily, I, 
I went and did the, when she told me to go look at it, I went and did, she intended me to look at one video and there was a series of four. And I think I did the first three or almost through the, all the way through the third one. And I couldn't, I just couldn't do it anymore. I yeah. couldn't handle it. So I recall like the tone of the video and I sent it to Randy too. And I'd like to hear your comments in a second, Randy, as well on, the, on both the Melissa Melton video and the, the uh, Charlie the Unicorn video. But I had just recalled the tone, the Charlie, Charlie, yeah. that was yeah. still in my head. I had really forgotten about what the content of the video was. Very repetitive and hypnotic stuff yeah. in the videos. And it was basically to a pink and a blue unicorn waking the white unicorn up from, he was trying to rest, he was napping, he was enjoying being asleep or whatever. I'm sure it's like a you know, metaphor for the sleeping people or whatever. And they wake him up and coax him into going to this candy mountain or candy cave or whatever it is. And he doesn't want to go and he doesn't want to go. But he finally, you know, but they say, oh, there's wonderful candy in there. It's amazing candy. It's amazing candy. And they finally talk him into it and he goes into it and it's, he just goes totally blank. It's nothing but a black hole. When he comes out, he's missing an organ and he's back asleep and he's got, you know, blood all over him. And oh my gosh. So, yeah. you know, this could be metaphor for, you know, kids going to raves and doing drugs and not knowing what happened. And did they have some kind of thing happen to them? I mean, I've spoken you know, about the possibility of human trafficking around, you know, around some of this stuff. Um, but, you know, there's all this candy in there. And in the 90s and in the early 2000s in the rave scene, there was all of this club kid kind of stuff. They were called candy kids, right? These kids who would wear enormous bright colored clothing and all these beads and all, you know, look kind of silly and you couldn't kind of, they all look like rainbow bright or, you know, whatever. And there was a huge uh, push in, in, during that period of time. There was ketamine was a kind of a hot drug and ketamine is, is horse tranquilizer, right? So you have Charlie the unicorn, you know, who, that's a horse, right? And, right. you know, the, the, people are taking horse tranquilizer and what, what is going on with this? And I think the symbolism of, you know, a unicorn can mean a lot of things. I think Melissa brought some of that up to a good effect in the video, but I see it as like, you know, the extension of the pineal gland is like a, a, um, a receptor, right? Like they're sort of using the pineal gland to program certain ideas, but also to get guys walking around with a big dick on their head because, you know, there's, we're, we're in a war against men and men are dickheads, right? So there's that. <laughs> well, let me throw, let me, let me hear what Randy thought of uh, the yeah. videos. And then I want to throw out some things too, uh, yeah. a little more alchemical and um, history of, of what the, the unicorn can symbolize. Let's hear it. Yeah, yeah. So, Randy, what, what did you think? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> okay, so Let's hear it. As, as far as the, who are the ladies that did the, I'm not familiar with this this particular the media people that you, you know, know Melissa Melton and, and Aaron. They're Truth Stream Media. They're the two that used to work okay. for Alex Jones and defected. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. So that video confirmed something that I've been seeing for a long time, which was, and this goes into the rainbow thing and the unicorn and all the symbology behind it. And I will say that every time I see this, I see this in this application as heavy sexual programming for children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, largely, because, largely because the use of both the rainbow and the unicorn brings you into the LGBT wheelhouse. And I'll try and say to do this without being offensive to anybody's sensibilities, but quite honestly, that's all integrated, especially into the transgender community. And mm. so there are certain signifiers there, triggers that come into play as well. And then the second series, the four videos, what was, it was... Um, Charlie the Unicorn. Yeah. Um, do you remember when we found that video... Uh, Want to see my pencil by Jeff yes. Kasky on YouTube? Yes. Yes. Did you notice that the? Okay, so the first thing that jumped out at me, other than the fact this is one of the most irritating videos I've ever seen, the cadence of the voice, <laughs> the silliness, the yeah. repetition. It does sound really like that. Want to see my pencil? Yeah, no, it does a lot. There's something yeah. to this. There's another programming level to this, and I huh. was listening to it. I watched the video, but I wasn't really so much watching it. I, I, I was listening to it, and it really, really ground let me, on me. Let me tell Elisa what we're talking about. In case yeah. she doesn't know. So, Elisa, when we, Randy and I 
definitely probably did the strangest video about the Parkland, Florida shooting yep. that did get censored, did get taken down. You can still see it on Vimeo. We went a totally different route with it. We were not concerned with false flag or not. We yep. were concerned with, you know, what are the background of some of these players? What are the weird, you know, esoteric symbolic connections here? And one of the things we found that one of the kids who was being interviewed a lot was this kid, Cameron Caskey. And that he had a very interesting father who seemed to have eight or 10 or 12 di different careers, all things that would be perfect, you know, CIA cutout cover. Well, he was kind an of entertainment career. attorney, plus he was a real estate guy. Plus he had an adoption agency for like disabled kids, kids and all sorts of weird out, stuff, right? Yes, but he had, these, he had these videos that he had made that, uh, that were on YouTube Still that makes. Go, goes along with sort of the Elsa Gate kind of stuff. You know what that mm -hmm. was? It is very Elsa, Elsa Gate. Gate. No, Elsa Gate was like the use of like um, children's like uh, uh, animated videos to like uh, groom kids for you know pedophilia and stuff like that, right? So okay. he had this video called something like "Want to see Jeffy's pencil." You want right? to see? It was called "Want to see my, my pencil." Want to see my pencil? Yeah. And wow. this was like so we found this in you know th these video that this guy these videos that this guy had made. And you know, we did a show with we, with just Randy and I on this, and then we did a show with Robert and uh, Jennifer Constantine on this. And and actually, Robert got into some actual like one on one Twitter battles with this Jeff Kasky guy, right? And you know, the, so this guy who's here, who's saying his kid was part of this, you know, thing, makes these pedophile videos. And we had, you know, I can't remember the exact content of our video, but we had found all sorts of weird stuff tying them to all sorts of underground kind of pedophilia stuff, all sorts of simulated like the software that creates simulated environments for, you know, like, you know, shootings and things like that, all sorts of weird stuff. But he's right. The voice was the same as the Charlie. The guy was like, Charlie, Charlie, this voice, it would look like a- um, These are voices, these are voices that- the, It was saying, Jeff, want to see my pencil? Jeffy, Jeffy, want to see my pencil? It was like that, yeah. It's oh. pandering to a child mentality, right. but it's actually below that. But it's designed to pull a child into a world and the cadence, the use of the voice, the repetition of it is an entrainment. Uh -huh. Like yeah. the patterns that I recognize of what you would use to program small children fit into this. And when I heard it, it was very, it, you know how something hits you and it's discordant and you get that smack yeah. in, your, oh, yeah. in your gut? Yeah. Okay, this me hit too. me that way. Me and too, yeah. I have to say, it's very similar to Jeff Kasky's work with Want to See My Pencil, because I think this is a consistent modality of things that are used to do programming on children. And I think yeah. what it did with me is it hit a certain trigger that I have as well. And so it was kind of distressing. I got through the first one, and then I realized that Emily had sent me links for the other ones. I watched bits and pieces of it, but I felt the real takeaway there was just what they were doing. I'll note too, that when the blue and pink unicorn wake up, the white unicorn, did you notice how the one unicorn was jumping on the white unicorn while it was laying down? Now it yeah. was inverted, but mm. there was just my takeaway from it, or maybe my dirty mind, but the innuendo involved with that seemed to be somebody that was being jumped in mm. sort of a, an overtly sexual way. So, and the blue, the blue and the pink unicorns, let's face it, mm -hmm. in certain genres of, let's just say the swinger community specifically, a unicorn is viewed as the middle person in a menage a trois. Oh. Okay, so you have the blue and the pink unicorns, and the white unicorn is the unicorn, which is the third person. It's the, it's the drug unicorn, the one who's being taken advantage exactly, of by both Exactly, people. Okay, yeah. so this ties exactly into how I feel like this was being used in, in the rave scene. So this came about, and what I noticed around people who were doing K was it was largely used by... Old, so not when I say older gay men, I don't mean old gay men. I mean like gay men who are maybe in their 20s or 30s. And they would be trying to, they would be getting younger straight men or younger men who were on the border or questioning, they would get them hooked on K and develop a relationship with them. And I saw a lot of this in, in, the, in the rave community. And it did seem like a lot of these other drugs that seemed to feminize certain men or get them in a kind of a headspace where just like, 
there's something is programmed, right? It's, it reverts them to like a childlike stem stage. And then this older man or this older partner or whatever, you know, would sort of be like a father figure or daddy figure to them, right? Well, that's exactly them, what right? that is. That's called the daddy scenario. Oh, yeah. I didn't even know that. Okay. Yes. So then what, what, what would happen? So um, at least I don't know if in any of your, you know, wild times you ever experienced ketamine, but um, I did. And I, you know, I tried it voluntarily once and one time I was dosed with it. Um, and it makes you feel like, or at least that's, so the time I was dosed with it, I was, the first, the time I, tr I tried it voluntarily, I thought it was awfully strange. Like I sat on a bed and I was like having a conversation with my friend, but it was like, like we weren't saying anything, but it was like a deep conversation where nothing was being said. It was very weird. It lasted about 15 minutes. I felt like things were moving close to me and far away. And it was like weird. And I felt like we were really, we were like sitting on a bed and I felt like we were really just sinking into the bed, like becoming one with the bed. And, you know, it was nothing was going on. It was just a friend and whatever, but there's other people in the room, but it was just like very like lose track of space and time and all that kind of thing. Right. And then a few months later when I got dosed with it, I had like, I have friends who shot ketamine and were jealous of the K-hole that I went into. Right. And what it felt like, I was in a car, I was, I was actually in a car, and in the side view mirror of the car, I was watching a movie in my, of my life, and I couldn't understand, I was mad at my friends because they hadn't told me they were actors, but I couldn't understand why if they were actors, they were wearing their own clothes and they didn't have wardrobe. If we were in a movie, why were they wearing their own clothes? So mm -hmm. it was this, but it, it, you know, this was all weird while it was happening, but it wasn't like, oh, this is the worst thing in the world, I wasn't scared, it was just like, this is so weird. I'm in a movie, everything is a movie. So there's a part of me that feels like, was this something that, it almost felt Truman Show-ish, right? Like, oh, everything is about me. I'm the kind of center of the world. And there's this movie being made about me driving around in the car, wondering why my friends are, you know, that kind of thing. Like, I wonder if some of this headspace of having a hard time separating uh, fantasy from reality, which has gone, been used a lot in the rave scene and with electronic dance music and whatever, it's one of the most surveilled communities, period. If this was really warm up for, you know, blurring this line between reality and technology and preparing people for the romance of surveillance, right? Of like, oh, you know, that, that kind of, you know, being seduced by that sort of feeling of like, you know, being the center of some kind of, you know, it was very, it was a very strange experience. Um, and, you know, people, I never had any interest in doing it again. I mean, I can appreciate weird experiences, so I'm not, you know, not necessarily unhappy that I had it because now I've had the experience and I have it again. But, you know, it was, it was really a strange experience. But some people that I knew were just obsessed with it. Like they did this over and over. They imported it from veterinarians in Mexico and whatever because it was hard to get here. They'd break into clinics and steal it. And, you know, and this was like this, this desire to be in this really funny space this void, the black hole in the cave or whatever, just outside and off, off over here out of reality. Um, but a surveilled, you know, like it's like being in a black hole, but surveilled while you're in there, right? It's very strange. And it just makes me wonder, you know, what was, the, you know, and then also some of this blurring, right, of um, gender and sexuality and whatever, like fine, someone's gay, they're gay, they're transgender, they're transgender. But we, we, we've come in, you know, it was always this sort of mishmash of stuff in the rave scene of, you know, get men and women dressed in all these multicolors and the same and now we sort of live in this weird kind of situation where you know people's male and female aspects to their brain and their personality should be coming into balance but instead we have this weird outer weird outer phenomenon right, right. And, and i just wonder if you know something like this plays into it and if ketamine was kind of a test for all of an early test for all of these sedative kinds of things that are being sprayed all over us and put in our food and put people in this sort of you know, malaise, this trance-like state. So, I don't know. What do y'all think? Not, oh, go wasn't ahead. ketamine part of MK Ultra? Wasn't what? Yeah. Wasn't ketamine part of MK Ultra? That was one yeah, of the many drugs. Was. Yeah. And yeah. when you had asked if I had ever tried it, yeah. I have these bizarre, you know, and a lot of them are in my books, these bizarre interactions with these beings and things. And I often wonder, I know, I know I was, you know, there were all kinds of things mm -hmm. put in me over the years. Yeah. And I have no idea other than reading, you know, um, I get some general ideas when I read some of the old MK Ultra material where they talk about some of the drugs they were using, but I'm pretty sure ketamine was listed. Ketamine well, ketamine is, well, ketamine is basically yeah, is. Yeah. 
ketamine is used to initialize and stabilize anesthesia in surgical procedures. For animals. So it is, it is a precursor yeah. sedative. Okay. But I believe you're right about that. Cause, and I will tell you this. Um, I was sitting here thinking ketamine. Um, I interviewed Timothy Wiley, the late Timothy Wiley, who mm -hmm. was part of the Process Church. Mm -hmm. Timothy Wiley used a shit ton load of ketamine mm -hmm. to experiment on himself. Mm. And it is considered therapeutic for mm -hmm. use in certain cases of extreme depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Yep. But um, I think this drug as, as a date rape slash club drug, mm -hmm. really what you were just talking about, even within the context of the whole club scene and what's happening to morph gender and to morph sexual identity and to push people who have certain tendencies in a certain direction uh, to be hustled, mm -hmm. all goes into this, this whole unicorn rainbow thing. Mm -hmm. It's creepy. Yeah, Elisa, no, I, I, I was reminded of, uh, do you remember Harry Potter? The yeah. Philosopher's Stone. The, the unicorn was sacrificed um, for Voldemort so that he could live. And unicorn blood was really special. And yes. Remember that? I mean, that was that was yep. quite a long time ago, actually, Philosopher's Stone. So, yeah, I think it's been in the making for a long time. And there's the there's the um, the history. Oh, okay. Besides, I, I wrote down a few notes from today. Besides um, Harry Potter, in um, Lewis Carroll's uh, book, um, which the is Looking Glass, through the Looking Glass, a sequel. Yeah the sequel to Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, okay? Mm -hmm. And he has, um, he has, she climbs through the mirror and all is reversed. There's unicorn programming in there, but in other words, she actually goes into the mirror and once she goes through the, through the looking glass, everything is reversed, um, which is total MKUltra programming. Yes. Um, and I talk about reversals in my books, some of my experiences with mm -hmm. that, but that, that's really big. Upside well. down and backwards, yeah. Yeah, and mm -hmm. you know, pain is love, love is pain, so on and so forth. There was a lot of things that, that for me were um, you know, complete reversals. Well, also, um, that would be the, also with some of the stuff with ketamine, what is the movie and what is reality, right? Like it's this whole, right. yeah. Right. And of course, we all know that Alice in Wonderland was huge in, in um, earlier decades in MKL programming. programming. Um, and then, uh, what was it? Harry Potter. And then some of the history, I, some of the kind of the- So uh, Unicorn's blood was special. And remember on that Charlie's Unicorn at the end, his stomach is cut and he's laying there bleeding, right? It's like, yeah. and, and, and you know, of course the ketamine is a horse tranquilizer and a unicorn is a glorified horse. So right. yeah, okay. And then there's the um, more esoteric um, side. You know, we, we've been discussing what I would call the exoteric, which is yes. the very material. But the esoteric side of this is the unicorn, um, along with the lion, is a symbol of Mercurius. Um, and Mercurius is a Roman god of speed and trade, uh, sometimes a messenger of the gods, and he's the equivalent of, in Greek mythology, Hermes, which is really mm. interesting because yeah. he's the god of roads, commerce, invention, cunning, and theft. Um, so to Ooh. me, I think there's also a very, uh, yeah. very esoteric side to this. And in the Middle Ages, the unicorn, and I find I always kind of like to go towards what is that, that spiritual representation. And it said in the, middle, in the Middle Ages, the unicorn was the allegory of Christ and the Holy ghost and i got that information off of a website aras.org aras.org and it just gets into some of the alchemical um sides and of course um the coat of arms for the uk is the unicorn and the lion mm -hmm. um and the unicorn represents scotland so you know when you know um when you know the history of mind control and the networks and mm -hmm. how long this has been around and what's really really ushering in this age and how long that's what's been happening for me lately uh, not only about the unicorn but just in general is i'm having this 
incredible experience of coming to understand on a whole different level how long and forces that have been at work mm -hmm. to bring this into being. And I know we've talked about bloodlines and all, but it's just so, I mean, it's, it's mind boggling. Um, I've been reading some, some stuff about, you know, the, um, I mean, literally thousands of years ago, how uh, like an impulse of a particular being, like say Luciferic impulses into an individual that was great in our history, was considered, mm -hmm. let's say, a genius or, um, and came up with a development or an invention that changed the course of human history in that time. Mm -hmm. And then it could go another thousand or 2000 years and it happens again. Um, and then another genius or uh, maybe a master guru who starts a, a very profound spiritual movement or say like a Tesla person mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. a great inventor and it will change the whole course of our evolution, our yeah. development, our evolution. And it seems good all the time, right? It's a, it's a great thing. But what happens is with these forces all along the way, um, you know, doing this, it's directing it towards closer and closer to what I, I consider the ultimate. And, and a lot of people would, a lot of wonderful researchers would, would state this towards that transhumanist agenda. Right. Which is when, when I think of it, and I think this, this unicorn's, symbolism is a part of that because um the unicorn also represents um the spirit the spirit mm -hmm. of life mm -hmm. and so when you you look at this e exoteric representation and you know and know something about the esoteric and how long and how driven this is i think that there's something else being sent out again one of these hidden in plain sight, um, mm -hmm. where uh, those in the know, and I'm talking about the esoteric alchemical geniuses, mm -hmm. <laughs> masterminds, frightening masterminds of our time, that when something hits the exoteric world mm -hmm. like this, and it seems, as you said, it seems like, um, you know, little girls and little boys and mommies and daddies are getting into it and it's all seems so superficial well lurking below is this uh hidden in plain sight message and i'm not saying i can completely decipher it but it's like what randy was saying about how that that's that voice sound mm -hmm. uh ground yeah. to him it, it's it's unnerving okay mm -hmm. it's unnerving you're watching some supposedly silly animated film and all the way down in your groin, there's this awful mm -hmm. feeling like, yeah. uh, I want to go take a shower. I want to yeah. get out of the room. I don't want to turn this no, off. This is one of those uh, moments when I will almost get nauseous. Yeah. yeah. And Emily and I've talked about this before, about even our own individual backgrounds and some of the programming we think we've gone through. And the unicorn thing on the surface looks so, because it's, it's a fluffy it's symbol. Unicorn it's, 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 and, well, I mean, unicorns and, and are oddly enough, somebody today on a Facebook post that I put, I actually, this was a, a series of photos of my young grandson who models for his mother, who's a photographer. Somebody put a unicorn rainbow as a comment underneath my grandson's picture. Oh my goodness. Which, and given, given what I had just finished watching, which was all of those videos, kind of freaked me out. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I wanted to point out too, I don't know if anybody's aware of this, but the unicorn actually is cited in the book, the Bible, like in the King James Bible as well. It's not in modern translations, but it's actually in there nine times. Five different authors, um, Moses, David, Isaiah, uh, mention the unicorn. It's in the oldest book, considered to be the oldest book in the Bible, the book of Job where it says, um, canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow, or will he harrow the valleys after thee? This particular, you know, I used to do Bible studies on radio. This particular verse is really creepy in the context of what it is, and people can go look it up. 
But the unicorn here is not exactly a benevolent, fluffy symbol of um, love, peace, and kumbaya. I think it's very, es I think it's very it's esoteric. esoteric. Yeah, mm -hmm. very esoteric. It's and the exoteric version is like you said. It's this silly, fluffy, happy, childlike. Mm -hmm. And it's nothing, which there's probably a lot of things we could list that, that fall into that category mm -hmm. that have a, a much, you know, a much darker meaning or a, a much darker source. Mm -hmm. A couple of things come up for me. First of all, when you were talking about the um, God of, uh, of trade, roads, trade, con, theft, it's making me think of trafficking networks, right? Like, is this, you know, like of both drug trafficking, obviously, but human trafficking and, or an industry, it's an industry, industry, you know? an industry. Like, and it's making me think of organ trafficking, right? Because we see that there, like, is this somehow, you know, relate I, I, a lot in a lot of these things that have come up. I, we just released a show, it'll go up on YouTube today that I did with Derek Bros, and we got into some interesting stuff about the eyes being the identifier of who's going to be taken into some of these traffic networks and, and all of this kind of jazz. But, you know, I, I, you know, uh, sex, human trafficking for many things, including you know, besides just sex, right? Organ trafficking. Uh, I'm, we're getting into this space where we're talking about, are they looking into people's eyes for genetic information, for, yes. DNA, for, for genetic memory stored? Does, does, do my eyes have some history, some items stored in them? You know, so we're getting into some pretty weird stuff here. But when you said that, and I was thinking about these, you know, these, these people, these alchemical geniuses know where to look for what, these families, these bloodlines. But I'm also thinking we're, what, unicorns and rainbows always come up together, right? And so, yeah, you know, rainbow's huge in my programming. I was in a movie called Rainbow. I have Wizard of Oz programming. What would be one thing you could take to get over the rainbow? You could ride over the rainbow on a unicorn, right? You know, right. and so that, that would be a way to sort of you know, entice a kid, right, yeah. with the unicorn. And then I, I think I said this before, but also this thing, you know, um, that's growing out of the unicorn's head in the same spot where our pineal gland would be. It's like now you have people who are doing all this supposedly spiritual stuff and taking psychedelic drugs. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but all of these, you know, spiritual things and things people are doing to open that also leaves them open to a lot of other things coming in. And just like being led around by the nose, people are being led around by their pineal gland now. Right. Let me show yeah. you this. I want to share the screen here for a minute. I just want you to see this. This is a book. Can you see that? Mm-hmm. Okay, this is a book that's actually out on Amazon right now. This is some of the stuff I was digging around with earlier today. It's called The Unicorn Delusion, How to Kill Your Inner Bitch. And it goes into this whole snowflake syndrome that we're starting, yeah. to, we see with these kids. And it goes into- The, the social the justice warrior stuff. Everybody's a special snowflake, Lisa, if you don't know what we're talking about, right? Everybody, you know, should never have their feelings hurt and all that kind of stuff, you know? So this unicorn thing to me is a programming it's it's mm -hmm. being combined with a lot of a lot of other images mm -hmm. and a yeah. lot of i guess what you would call uh sensory programming as well mm -hmm. and even this this era now of entitlement and ultra sensitivity and the pronoun decorum that's come in with transgender plays into all of this mm -hmm. because yeah. it's a it's a reprogramming it's a reframing of the culture itself um this is taking the whole spirit away taking the whole spirit away of what it really means to be human as an individual as an individual yeah it's mm -hmm. really a it's actually everybody wants perfect. to be a unicorn you just now. did it you did it thank you you pulled it right through the loop that's what i was going for it's not about what people are experiencing sensing or feel about themselves it's about this group identity that's coalesced around this cluster of social programming it's yes. like a, it's like and when you start to look at the use of symbols in social programming and you look at the unicorn in that backdrop you can see how powerful this thing is especially when it's being used as an icon and a sigil mm -hmm. all over the place yes. it's become well, the thing that you can throw in front of people and it registers yeah. something and it has an emotional yeah. Yeah. field to it well, it also generates thoughts of rainbows, which lead to color spectrum programming, right? So you can show somebody a unicorn, they'll think of, I mean, if you listen back to some of the, the one of the things we did several 
a couple of years back now where we talked about a certain thing that I had discovered with Facebook and a symbol and a geometry and a this and a that, right? So you see the unicorn, you think of the rainbow, it spreads out the colors, each color is associated with the program for different, you know, it, it can do a lot of stuff with one quick, uh, especially if you look at the unicorn that has the rainbow spiral on its head, which a lot of the icons are, right? So, yeah, the other and, thing, and, you know, I'll throw in here just, I won't go through the whole thing, but I was in Washington, I was living and working there. Um, my boyfriend at the time came up from Florida. He had wanted to move up that way. He came up, he was there, and then a friend of ours came to visit, and that was a really weird, uh, weird situation. It's every time I think about the three of us, can't really explain it, but it's a, it's a gross feeling. Mm -hmm. It's a really gross feeling. And um, anyway, mm -hmm. we were going out to dinner. We were in a car. Um, and we got into a fight, my boyfriend and I, we pulled up, it was, I remember it was dark out. We pulled up in front of the restaurant and I just said to him, I'm done. I'm out of here. And I walked off and, and they went into the restaurant. Mm -hmm. I wound up going back. Now remember, this is a person who's very programmed, still very much being used. Um, I went back to, uh, the place where he was. I gathered all my things. I packed, I was absolutely frantic at this mm -hmm. point. I used to live in a lot of anxiety and this panic would come over me. And I always had this run programming, just get, just get out, get out now. And I packed things up and I remember thinking, I didn't want to leave anything. I didn't want him to know anything about where I was. I, I had to, I had to hide now. And I was walking, I didn't even have a car and I walked down, I knew there was this little mom and pop motel and I went and you could still pay cash in those days, which is yeah. what I used to do all the time and paid cash for a room. I got in the room and I flicked the light on, turned around, closed the door and I closed the door this way and I turned this way and this huge print of a unicorn, I mean a really cheesy, cheesy uh -huh. thing, you know, but big and framed. And I remember the sensation, just this peace mm. and calm. And I just stood there staring at it. And I remember I started weeping and I just stood there staring at it. And this, like everything in my body just wow. calmed down. Everything was okay. I was safe now. And I have to say part of that was what I call hotel motel programming. Right. Um, it was, a, I was always going to rooms and waiting you know, there, I have a lot of memories of, and I would feel safer. And that lasted well into deprogramming. I know I'm getting off, off. No, um, you're fine. Off, this is how it goes. You're fine. The, um, the, even when I was in deep deprogramming, I had places to live when I would walk through town and see a, a certain motel or hotel, I, the craving to, to live there was yep. profound. I understand but, that. So I have to say that, you know, that situation with the unicorn print and the motel was probably a combination but the closing of the door the locking the chaining whatever mm -hmm. and then turning but I just remember standing and I don't remember what I did immediately after that well I remember you, later it sounds like in the room but I remember just standing there staring at it I mean it was so you know, it was, almost like you were tranquilized it was a tranquil feeling it was, right it so was if I was just yeah. triggered bam right into that, a whole so different I really I really wonder about this unicorn tranquilizer kind of connection, right? This tranquil kind of thing you're talking about. About the hotel thing, I totally understand what you're talking about. To this day, I sleep much better in a hotel than I ever sleep in my own house. You know what I mean? It, with the except, exceptional occasion of every once in a while, I find myself in a hotel where something feels completely not right to me and I just will not sleep at all. I would just be like completely like, no. But right. um, yeah, I understand that desire about the hotels and motels. I totally know the feeling. I think that's probably not uncommon for many people in our audience. <laughs> right. No, yeah, so, complete I opposite. Know, I, I don't know the, the specifics of unicorn, even in myself. I don't know, mm -hmm. you know, I, other than that experience and then discovering it in, like I said, I'm pretty sure I saw it um, amongst, amongst many symbols in the Fritz Springmeyer stuff. Randy, do you have something you want to say? No, I was just commenting. I don't sleep well in hotels at all. It's noisy. That's it's a good It's psychically sign. very <laughs> noisy in a hotel yeah. for me. Yeah. So. yeah. I know what you're, the, the psychic noise, I know what you're talking about. But for some reason, like, I think that, like, for me, like, uh, I have memories of being just, like, 
maybe exhausted by the time I would get back to a hotel, right? And so you could cl close the blackout, yeah. you know, drapes and yeah. just sleep, right? Yeah. And but, but the sleep would always end with the phone ringing, right? Well, that's yes. gonna say, yeah. I mean, I have numerous, numerous yeah. of being in a, in a motel or hotel waiting. Mm. I mean, and, and being something sent to me or the mm -hmm. phone or, um, yeah, I mean, just sitting and waiting to go on task. Yep. Mm. So. I think that for me, it's more of like uh, finally getting back there after something very late, you know, like, and then just crashing out, right? And then just yeah. being completely out of it until the phone rang. Well, and, you know, I've got a, I'm always curious. I've, I've found things in, I know how, I, I remember how paranoid this sound when I first started talking about it, but I would go, you know, I'd be in a town and I'd go to a motel or hotel and like this one, I mean, okay, maybe it was just coincidence, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I had this repeatedly happen in different cities in different states where I was drawn mm -hmm. to a very particular motel or hotel. Mm -hmm wasn't that I would just wanted any of them. It's that one. Mm -hmm. And um, it same thing happened when I moved to Moab. Um, and I knew where I needed to go. And this is a very old hotel in Moab. It's, it's you very well me, known. Yeah. Hollywood. Yeah, you okay. me. I mean, it's, yeah. it was all these movies were filmed, all these movie stars stayed there. And it's just a mom and pop. Okay, it's just a little two story deal. No big, nothing fancy. But I went in the room. And um, it was like, I mean, there were a half dozen, this was, I was a little more awake at this point. There were a half dozen things in the room. It was like an MK Ultra trigger zone. Well, and all the way down to, this was really bizarre, okay? All the way, this, was, this one I have never forgotten. You know those cheesy bedspreads, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that's got the print on the top side and the bottom side is that, you know, the just the backing on the material. Yeah. Nothing fancy. Well, I you know, flipped it over. I was using it as a cover. And on the, um, what do you call it? The, um, the hem, the inseam, the, the hem. hem. Thank you on the hem on the reverse side, spaced out mm, about a foot apart all the way around was the circle with the cross in it. Of course. Which was the symbol of Cain. Yeah. <laughs> and so I knew that at that point, but you know, I flipped the thing back and Somebody had, I mean, they were perfect, but it had been added all the way. Think about that. I yeah. mean, on an esoteric level, you're sleeping in a bed mm -hmm. that, you know, is surrounded. And there were all these other things in the room. So back to my personal experience in that motel room in Washington, it really makes me wonder, what, what is it play here? Like, like Randy's photo of his child. And then today of all days, somebody puts a unicorn with a rainbow underneath it. <laughs> There's something beyond, um, I've experienced so many times, and I, I'm sure you guys both have, uh, over and over it's consistent. There's something in, you know, and I tried to write about it in book two, but in the ether, it's-, it's The this atmosphere energy. is aware. The atmosphere is aware and is collecting information on what every time we breathe in, we take in information from it. When we breathe out, it takes in information and is and responding I, to us. Yeah. I it's think it too- you know, my, my particular understanding and experiences, I link it to this Arimonic age, this Luciferic age. It's, it's, it's a type of imprinting. It's basically it imprinting. Is. It's, imprinting. it's everywhere. It's, it's, it's listening. I, yeah. This is the power of, this is, again, we'll probably not talk about this enough, how sigils and icons work in imprinting images into the mind that are extremely detailed and contain a lot of data that cannot be verbally communicated. Right. It, is, it is beyond subliminal in that sense because it can do multi-layered, multi-textural information yes. downloads using a single symbol. And I think when, when we we're talking about the unicorn and we're seeing it just all over the culture now and the way it's used, it's, 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 as I pointed out in, in the video, um, this isn't just some cute, fluffy little kid thing. This is in the adult culture. It's, it's, it's being, it's so wide. There's nothing unique about it. What was it? 
in the video, they were talking about uh, the unicorn, one of a kind, and and they said, well, how can for how one of a kind can it be when everybody yes. is adopting these unicorns? <laughs> right. And well, see, and that's how, what they that's that's programming right there because what they want you to do is they want you to think you're special. This is right, snowflake right. programming. Right. Okay? But, but you're not really special. You're a conformist. Mm -hmm. Right. And this is the danger. You know, this is the the download that this sigil has attached to it based on what I think we've uncovered. Well, it's and also you're the, talking about the esoteric, you know, you're talking yeah. about that, that hidden meaning in, hidden in plain sight. It's, it's on the surface. It looks like something esoteric mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. underneath it is, it is working, you know, yep. just like those, those, all those symbols in that room, in that motel room in Moab, you know, it's like, it was working. And fortunately, I was aware enough to know, okay, this thing's not good. And oh, God, we got this over here. I know this stuff is hitting me. I can feel it. You know, that anxiety just rose up. But for the, the person, you know, it's so funny you said this, Randy, because I just went through this today. I was just driving through town here. And I stopped to let some people go on a pedestrian walk. And there were teenagers in there. There was a couple of young men. And the way they were dressed, it was like they were thinking they were rebelling. They were total conformists. They were completely programmed in the way they were dressed. They were trying to make, they didn't fit the profile. They were emulating the iconic music rap stars and the whole bit, right? Yeah, They're yeah. trying to be something that they think is going against the system and they have no idea that they don't even have a choice. They gave up choice a long time ago already. Yeah. You know, yep. it's like they've already conformed to exactly what they see. That's it. There's nothing any deeper than that. It's yeah. simply, and I know this sounds really harsh to be judging these kids, but it hit me like a ton of bricks as he walked in front of me and walked across that I see this. It's, it's this this individuality, um, the spirit, and again, back to the unicorn representing, um, what was it, the unicorn and the lion, and I think it's the lion represented the soul and the unicorn represented the spirit, mm -hmm. and that just, that made so much sense to me because that is what's being extracted as we continue to move very quickly, in my opinion, towards this transhumanist agenda, which you brought in the LBG, I don't even know what all belongs on there anymore. Um, <laughs> oh, don't even get me started, because no, I no, am no. not PC. It, it, it's or, true. I, I mean, so you know, I'm nauseated by PC. Now, the, know, the, the whole movement, even some of the people inside of it realize that it's just gotten ridiculous. <laughs> it's got, let me it's draw one time. more thing back here. I, mean, I wanted to say something, too, before we move on to the next topic. So, so, in, in Chinese mythology, there is a unicorn legend as well. It's called the Qilin. That is actually a type of uh, a hybrid or chimera. And there are different body types that swap out of it. It still has the horn. It's not necessarily yes. the unicorn. But this brings us back into transhumanism again. Well, yeah, also which, remember in the video, in the video, uh, Melissa's talking about there's owls with unicorn horns on, yeah, there's yeah. teddy bears with unicorn horns yeah. on. And this goes back in history, by the way, what he's saying. It goes way back. Dragons and mm -hmm. all kinds of things with unicorn with the horns. And horn. so the other, the other side of this is just coincidentally, because I'm getting a lot of synchronicities, I, I'm starting to go back into the mode to do these shows. And one of the things that hit my radar over the last couple of days has been this thing called CRISPR. Mm. Yeah, CRISPR. Yeah. Software, yeah. software yeah. hardware programming designed to do complete DNA reconstruction yep. from the genetic level up. And yep. how this is playing into CRISPR, which is gonna give us the ability to fully, in fact, I think it was even in the context of a unicorn that I saw this remark and, and I got chills again because they're now talking about the fact that we're gonna have the ability to basically cut, copy, and paste genes into new forms, new chimera, new hybrids. And right. you, at the same time as we're doing this, we have the unicorn overlay on the transgender movement, which right. is in itself an agenda to basically 
allow people to alter their bodies to be and to match a psychological profile. I, I'm not judging that. I'm simply saying that it's taken me a while to put this together and observe this culture, that this culture is very heavily mind controlled. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Real quickly, just I wanted to, what you were saying about the stuff with the hotel rooms, Elisa, you drove me by that hotel when I came to visit you in Moab. Oh, that's right. If you remember when I came to visit you in Moab, I stayed at that uh, bed and breakfast at Airbnb. Yeah. And remember yep. that bathroom? I took the pictures of what was on the walls in the bathroom. What and was it there was all those albums and they were all albums that I had liked when I was a kid, like Tina Turner and Flashdance and Michael Jackson and whatever. And then at the bottom, there was one I wasn't familiar with that had the huge monarch butterfly on it, remember? And I took a picture oh, and I brought it when I met you and Tani for coffee. And we went through and I had taken a picture of all the names of the songs and the, all the names of the songs were mar like monarch trigger phrases. You remember that? Yes, I do. And it was on the wall of the bathroom of the Airbnb that I so stayed at. So what was at. the album and who was the artist? I, I, I mean, I can't remember. It was like, the, it was a gentleman. It was from like the late 70s or early 80s. The album cover had a big butterfly on it. If I saw it again, I'd recognize it. I took a picture on my phone. Have I don't. If you ever find that, I'd be interested in how to match it. I, you know what, mate? I could, I could probably look back in my Airbnb record and it just and call the lady and say, you know, I love that bathroom. Can I get a picture of it? <laughs> You know, I'm telling you, this this is this is what I'm talking about. There's this, and I and I did. I tried to write about it. There's this. Uh, it permeates everything, mm -hmm. and and it guides and influences and pushes and pulls people this way and that way. And and we, for the most part, until we really begin to wake up significantly, don't know mm -hmm. this is happening. Yep. You know, we attribute it to other things. And no, you have compulsive signal, uh, com compulsive symbols that keep coming up. Well, I mean, even I mean, if you think about it, if, if I had been a year less deprogrammed than I was, then going into that bathroom could have triggered something in my meeting you, right? It, I mean, it's so, I mean, I was immediately aware of what it was when I saw it and what it meant, and I took the pictures so I could show you whatever. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Sorry, Randy, I didn't mean to cut you off. No. You didn't actually, you just completed it. Okay, yeah, perfect. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So all right. So uh, should we round up the first hour here? Elisa, please, before please, we yeah. move into the patrons hour, can you tell our listeners where they can find your work and how they can support you? Oh yeah. Um, well, I do have a uh, WordPress site, our life beyond mkultra.wordpress.com. And um, you can get a link to Amazon from there for the books, or you can go directly to Amazon for the books. Um, but it, I do like to tell people about the um, blog site because there's a lot of information for free on there. And interestingly enough, I, I haven't been updating it as much recently, but I have a ton <laughs> of stuff on there. And it's interesting when I go back, just to throw this caveat in, and I go through like some of the videos and stuff, gone. They're gone. There's yeah. more. It's a lot of that being A silent. lot of them yeah. are gone. Yeah. So, um, the other just thing I want to say about there. that site is, is your, that? your collages. Yeah. Your collage yeah. work. Trigger warning on that that I got to say, very useful for deprogramming. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when you go to the site and you begin to look at the collages there, um, I, I spent a, I spent and, a fair amount of time with these collages. Um, yeah, as did, and did I, I'm blown away by the similarities to things like yeah. these, you think yeah. that oh, this was my own weird experience that I can't explain to anybody, but there it is on her collage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, but also, you know, everybody, the books, um, trigger warning on those as well, but so very well worth the read because mm -hmm. you know there for for a lot of us who have questions, there's never going to be document proof, but nope. the proof is when you go and read a survivor's book and you find that there's stories in there that exactly, I mean, to a T, match things that happened to you that you thought were so strange you were never going to tell anybody. So, right. th you know, that's probably the amount of proof that we're going to get in this realm at this time. And so for, you know, people who are trying to understand their experience, it can be very useful, but trigger warning and give yourself, pa be patient with yourself and give yourself time to, to process what you read there. And yeah. just know that those books were intentionally written in very early deep deprogramming. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to write it in a way that just what you said for the people who think they're crazy 
and then they read it and they realize they're not. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. there's something very real to this. And so I was in and out constantly. And I mean, in and out of dissociative alters while I was writing those books. And um, it was a very bizarre experience, but I wanted it to be um, something that wasn't just afterwards. This is what, you know, now yeah, I'm all better because that doesn't happen. Yeah. 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 Very important. All right, guys, stick around. Join us over on the Patreon side at Off Planet, uh, Off Planet Media forward slash well, okay. Patreon.com forward slash Off Planet Media for the second hour, where the three of us are going to kind of get into a, a deeper and more personal conversation about uh, moving from the space of, uh, of recovery into living again and, uh, you know, starting to connect on a human to human level with people after, you know, years and years of isolation and how beautiful and how painful that can be at the same time. So, Join us on the other side. This is Off Planet Radio.